Welcome back to the Quantum Guide Show. Hi, everybody. Um, today, I'm, I'm very happy in episode 177 to introduce you to my new guest, Bob Engel. Bob owns and operates Exit the Matrix on Facebook and YouTube, and he's been researching human origins ancient history, spirituality, and various mysteries since he was in high school. Bob's aim is to encourage people to expand their minds and to stand strong against the world's controllers and their ever-expanding tyranny against humanity. To find out more about Bob and his research, the links are featured below in the description. Thank you for subscribing. Leave me a comment and smash that like button. Today in episode 177, we will discuss ancient origins and the quantum field. Bob, welcome to the Quantum Guide Show. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for inviting me, Karen. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. I know you've got so many interesting things to tell us and uh I'm wondering if you want to start off by uh, telling everybody kind of how you got started. I know you got started back when you were in high school, but how did you get uh, um, started in all of this? And uh, yeah, just tell us a bit about that. Um, I guess I was born curious. Um, growing up as a kid, I, I was just always interested in mysteries, you know, ancient history uh aliens and ufos and um i remember watching documentaries back even in middle school on you know did roswell crash and stuff like that and so i just i really got into stuff like that at an early age and i found it to be a passion and um in fact my uh my senior year in high school my last major english project i did it on the bermuda triangle I mean, I had a big old poster I made and I had all this other stuff with it. And uh, it was kind of funny because back then, you know, there weren't a lot of people into that stuff. And I think I was the only one that actually knew what I was talking about. <laughs> Everybody else was just like sitting there and they enjoyed it, but they were like, what is this guy talking about? You know? And uh, of course, you know, J Charles Berlitz, he, uh, his books really got me into delving into the Bermuda Triangle. And then as I, delved into that deep i started getting interested in like possible like portals on the earth and you know ley lines and all this other s possibilities tied in with the the whole bermuda triangle mystery and uh you know i guess to this day they haven't really proven what it is uh for the most part it's been explained as being natural occurrences with storms and other weather patterns and such and um you know electromagnetic stuff that happens in that area but regardless that's kind of what got me down on my first major rabbit hole and then um you know i was always encouraged by my dad to study the bible but it this wasn't regular this wasn't like your you know your sunday church study it was like read the whole book you know, study it front to back and fit and learn the prophecy in it. So I really got into Bible prophecy big time, um, like the books of Ezekiel and Daniel and Revelation and uh, stuff like that. And um, of course, Genesis and the creation stories, I always took a big um, interest in. Um, but so I kind of started out from that path as far as looking at spirituality and everything. But then something curious happened to me when I was 19 years old. Uh, well, my 18, 19, somewhere right around that point, I was already living on my own. I moved out after high school, moved in with some buddies and uh, was already a manager at a store. But regardless of that, um, we used to go out and meet after work all the time and play basketball. And this one time we were playing and I went up for to block a shot and my legs got swept out from under me and I landed really hard on my right hand and uh i broke the the bone right here uh, i don't know what that bone's called but you could literally i could push my finger in and fill the bones you know kind of at an angle and and it oh, yeah. oh, it was excruciating pain um my hand was all swelled up black and blue well even though i had a full-time job and i was a manager my insurance hadn't 
quite kicked in a hundred percent yet. So I, I, um, didn't want to go to the doctor and well, my, my brother's friend, he was into spirituality, more like Eastern medicine and stuff like that. And he'd been getting me to read this book called the, um, uh, Celestine prophecy, less Celestine oh, prophecy. Yeah. Yeah. I've read and, it. Yeah. And it's, it's supposed to be a fiction story. However, there's a lot of mystery school teachings embedded in that book. And so I read that book just right before this had occurred. And um, I decided one night when I was laying in bed, my hand was just in excruciating pain. I decided to start, you know, dabbling in this energy healing that it, that it taught in the book. And so I laid in bed and I just, I pictured in my in my solar plexus area like kind of like a male of or like a swirling of energy building up and up in the middle of my body in my chest area and i just kept on you know focusing on that and it kept getting stronger and stronger almost like if you've ever gotten too drunk almost blackout drunk and you get the spins really bad and it feels like you're just spinning around out of control and it's I always kind of found 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 that to be exciting that feeling, but some people make them sick, mm -hmm. you know. To each their own. I'm not saying I'm not encouraging this. I'm just saying that, trying to give people an example of kind of how it felt. But then, um, I kept focusing on that energy, and then my body started vibrating really, really strong. And then I focused that energy down my arm, and you know, down all the way to my hand. And then I just focused and held it there on my hand for, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, as long as I could. I, you know, it, it was, I, I'd never done anything like that before. And it was amazing, like what, what I was experiencing, but I kept with it as long as I could. And finally, I just got exhausted. And I just kind of went to bed after that, went to sleep. Well, the next morning I woke up and there was a dull ache in my hand, but it, it but the swelling had gone down. It was, it hardly hurt anymore. And the bone was straight now. And ever since that day, the bone's perfectly straight. Um, it was obviously broken for like at least two days. And um, so that really awoken me, you know, or sorry, I don't like to say awakened me to um, this power that we have to heal ourselves and this, um, I don't know, I guess you call it otherworldly, you know, energy or spiritual power that we could tap into. Now, the problem I ran into after I, I found this out, and it was a miraculous healing, um, I started struggling within myself because of my, you know, Christian beliefs, biblical beliefs, and how hard I delved into the Bible. And mm -hmm. so um, I really struggled with that, you know, because I didn't know if I was doing witchcraft or doing something that was evil or not, because a lot of people in the faith they fall into that belief, you know, that it is evil or it's something, you know, that they shouldn't be dabbling in. So, so yeah, that's kind of a, my, what my early, you know, beginnings and dabbling into a lot of like mysteries and, and ancient teachings and stuff. And then from there I started, um, studying the books, uh, like the, um, Nag Hammadi books, you know, the mm -hmm. Gnostic writings outside of the Bible and, the apocrypha books the you know dead sea scroll stuff and um then i started working my way into cuneiform and more ancient texts like the hindu vedic texts and such the you know the M M mahabharata and stuff like that so yeah yeah great sources of information and um were you able to get to the point where you could see some common threads in them, uh, were you able to um, see, like, for instance, um, a lot of what's in the Bible is also in the ancient um, cuneiform writings as well? And uh, were you able to see the different parallels? Absolutely. Um, in fact, you'll find parallels amongst all the ancient religions. Um, a lot of connections, you know, Zoroastrianism, and um, of course, a lot of the Greek uh, beliefs like Mithraism and Sol Invictus worship and a lot of the Egyptian mythologies. And uh, like I said earlier, the Vedic texts, you, you, you know, and then, of course, the Babylonian, the Assyrian, 
the um, Sumerian, and uh, the Hittite, and many other um, cuneiform writings also, which span thousands of years, that you do find that there is a connection amongst all of them. And uh, so you're mentioning the Bible, for instance. Well, in the cuneiform, people that haven't delved into the cuneiform, they may be surprised to find that a lot of the same stories are there. You've got the Tower of Babel stories. You've got the Genesis, Adam and Eve stories. Um, you've got the uh, the biblical flood story is also found in the cuneiform tablets. And uh, but however, I, I do want to add that um, some I start realizing is is a lot of the the um, I, I not trying to upset anybody here, but I would say. I feel like some of the adaptation that you find in the Bible of those ancient, those older, more ancient sources have been misunderstood a little bit, a little bit of uh, translation is lost yeah. in that. And um, so I found going back to those ancient, you know, thousands of year old, thousands of years older sources than the Bible, it, it gives you a lot, lot clearer picture into our early ancestors and, you know what they were experiencing during those ancient times yeah i would agree with you um well it's my understanding that about 500 years after christ is when they had the council of nicaea and mm -hmm. then they decided which of the which of the books they were going to put together and create the bible as we understand it today and of course all kinds of writings especially stuff about enoch was basically left out and now by going back and studying the ancient uh, cuneiform writings we're getting a more complete picture i don't know would you agree with that bob yeah absolutely uh verbatim um yeah the council of nicaea see what people don't realize is that we are still living under the roman power structure to this day it never went away what happened was is that the empire handed the torch to the religious order of the time and that early catholic church which became the um shortly after that the holy roman empire it was just a passing of the torch from one institution to another they never dissolved rome rome never died completely it just it uh adapted you could say you know and it mutated into a um Instead of a military-backed empire, it became a religious-backed empire. Mm -hmm. It's Yeah, it's really interesting. I did some research on the Borgia Popes, and boy, that sure opened my eyes. Oh, my God, I couldn't believe it. Now, I'm not here to bash religion. I spent most of my life being a deeply religious person. I've read the Bible uh, about three and a half times from cover to cover. Mm -hmm. Of course, the fourth the fourth reading, I didn't finish it. But anyway, um, you know, I actually used to be a Jehovah Witness for about 17 years. So I was really, you know, uh, into religion. And it's my belief now that if religion is serving you, then there's no need to get rid of it. But I myself have come to so much of a greater understanding of um, of, of the knowledge, the, the broader picture of knowledge that's basically been left out of the religions and i've not found anything in my research that has um you know discounted my higher spiritual beliefs in fact it helps me to be a more spiritual person um you know understanding especially the stuff like the books from enoch and and other things i i really like the story of gilgam uh Gil the epic of gilgamesh i love that it's awful long but sometimes i I put on um, somebody reading it, you know, before I go to bed. It's like having a grown-up bedtime story. I really <laughs> like it. But, um, yeah, so, um, well, good for you. So did you find that it shook up your religious paradigms or were you able to integrate that with your new, uh, with, with your new learnings? How did that go for you, Bob? So, yeah, so before I take us on a deep dive into this, um, I do want to say up front, um, just like you said, I'm not trying to bash anybody's religious beliefs either. Um, I I was there. I was deep in the Bible. I probably studied it as hard as almost anybody can out there, you know, um, front to back and just connecting the, the new and the old and all that. Um, 
And I do want to say that um, I do believe Yeshua, our brother, was a real person that walked the earth and that he was an ascended master and he was a, a master teacher and he was the son of God and he was the son of man, just as we are. You know, that's something people discount. He tried to teach us that. However, one thing I will, you will find out here, and I'm giving people a heads up now because this does upset a lot of people. I, from my study, I've come to the realization that the Old Testament God is not the father that Yeshua was teaching about, was not the, the unseen God, the creator of the universe, that the Old Testament God was in fact one of the Anunnaki. He was in the hierarchy of the Anunnaki. And that's coming from the Sumerian uh, cuneiform and some of the Akkadian and Babylonian. And uh, he's also was uh, one of the Canaanite gods. So I, I know this is going to upset some people, but that's what I've come to realize that there is a disconnect between yeah. the Old and New Testament. And I believe Yeshua was trying to teach us that, but religion tried to take the Old Testament, the Judean faith and ball it in with this new christian faith along with mithraism and and some zoroastrian and some egyptian and they took a lot from a lot of different religions even some druid pagan uh you know teachings and uh mythology and they basically turned that into a religion they took all of those things and so that's why religion today i i don't believe it even truly follows what it was meant to be um mm -hmm. you know there are good messages and there's some truth in it i'm not saying that but so um just kind of wanted to lay the groundwork there <laughs> <'Cause Yeah. laughs> i don't know how well, you feel about that where i'm coming at but no, i figured I, before I, we go into the next part <laughs> I, I agree in fact i'm a big fan of paul anthony wallace and Ooh, also yeah. of billy carson yeah and yes. they have um some very interesting perspectives and i also uh believe that um yeshua as you say uh call uh, what some people call christ jesus um you know gave us a higher standard uh on on how on the really important points mm -hmm. you know because you can get lost in the old testament with all the stories and the begetting and the this and the that and let's face it a lot of the accounts wow uh the god of the old testament was a pretty <laughs> mean dude you know and and so jesus i think or yeshua brought us back to a path of love which i think uh is is um uh, basically a recipe for success for humanity here on earth today. But I don't want to get religious. I just wanted to tell you, I hear you. I agree with you. And it's very interesting to look at this from the broader perspective. And once our eyes are opened, um, you know, we have more freedom in our thinking and in our lives. And so I think it's a really good thing. So yeah, just whatever, however you want to go deep as you want to go, Bob, go for it. Okay. So let's go to the beginning then. We'll go to um, what many would know as the Genesis story in, in the Old Testament. Um, so there are many cuneiform tablets that directly paint the picture of the Genesis story, of that the creation of man story. And so what I've found is by reading those stories, um, some people may have heard of some of these. There's the uh, the Atrahasis is the most direct tablet I found that it, it breaks down the Garden of Eden story. And then of course you have um, aspects of it found in the Epic of Gilgamesh, as you mentioned earlier, and in the Enuma Elish. And um, there's some other stories also. Um, there's uh, Enki and Ninma. Basically, um, that tablet uh, is where they are talking about doing uh, experiments on, on a human avatar. And um, so I guess before we open this completely, I, I want people to understand something that is very fundamental. They can even go to any Jewish rabbi and ask them this question, and they will explain this because this has been 
uh, mistranslated and misused in our current understanding of the Bible. And that starts at the very beginning where Elohim, God, right? So there's a major misconception here. Many people believe Elohim is Yahweh. Elohim is multiple gods. People need to understand this. El, El is a single God, is God. Elohim is gods. And you'll find this throughout Genesis. In, in the King James Version, in most of the, the versions of the Bible, it essentially says, you know, come let us make man in our image after our likeness or let or come let us create man in our image after our likeness and it's it's not verbatim i could pull up the scripture if you want me to read it exact but essentially in that in the hebrew they're calling god is elohim well elohim is multiple gods so and the reason why this matters current religion they try to write this off as being the trinity that Elohim is multiple because they're trying to say it's the Holy Spirit, Yahweh, and Yeshua, or Jesus. So there, that's actually wrong if you take it back to the cuneiform. The reason why Elohim is plural is because the story in Genesis is taken from these cuneiform tablets. It's adapted off of these various cuneiform tablets where... It talks about the Anuna gods, the pantheon of gods, the Sumerian gods, how they came to earth. That's where you get the word Anunnaki. Anu is the father creator. They call him um, Anu. You know, in fact, uh, in the Bible where they say El Elyon, El Elyon means the most high. Well, Anu would be El Elyon. He's the most high. In, in their pantheon. Now, he had two brothers that were often at odds with each other. One's name was Enki, also called Ea. He, he was a representative of the serpent family. And then you had his brother in Lil. Now, he's the character that we would call Yahweh in the Old Testament. He's the son of El Elyon. He is the God of the air. He's the commander of earth. And he's who you would call Yahweh in the Old Testament, at least according to my studies and other people that study into this also. And so there's a reason why Elohim is mentioned in Genesis, why it's, it's, it's written that way. It's because it was the gods that created man. Now, I want people to understand something here. When I'm, when I'm, when I'm going into this, I am not dismissing the creator of all, okay? I call the creator of all the source of all energy and creation, love and light, you know, whatever you want to add on to that. But this, this God and the, these gods in the Bible, they were humanoids. They were entities. They were not the creator of all. They were a, an advanced, highly technologically advanced, and possibly even more spiritually advanced species of humanoids. Now, this is according to the tablets. You'll, you'll find that these were not regular humans. You will find in the cuneiform that they actually created the Adamu as was to be a worker slave race for them, to work for them. This was Adam and Eve were never meant to um, just it wasn't like God just came here and created Adam and Eve to create this paradise for them to live in and name the animals and and frolic through the Garden of Eden. No, the, this these these characters in the Old Testament, Yahweh and the serpent, they were these uh, these brothers at odds with each other, and according to Atrahasis, the there was a rebellion going on amongst the Anunnaki. Oh, I'm sorry too. I, I jumped. I jumped. I just realized I wanted to clarify some. I'll go right back to that. Um, <laughs> I have a bad habit of this, so bear with me. I'll start going down on a tangent and I'll forget where I was going. So that's okay. Anunnaki, I want people good. to understand this. Anunnaki, Anu stands for heaven. He's El Elyon, like I said, he's the highest God. Now he had a consort, his wife. Her name was Key. Key means earth. 
And that's where that saying Anunnaki, it's from heaven to earth they came. So I wanted people to understand that. And now Anuna also basically means essentially the same thing, but it can mean powerful ones, shining ones, golden ones. Um, there's many different connotations to both of uh, to El to Elohim, to Anunnaki, and to Anuna, but it's essentially the same. Okay, just different slightly variations to the same characters essentially so i did sorry about that i wanted to clarify that i realized i didn't finish through with that so now going back to the atrahasi story so what happened was there was a, a rebellion going on amongst the anunnaki see the anuna were the royal class of the anunnaki race they were the royals the leaders the rulers now they had a worker class called the Yagigi, mm -hmm. the um, IGG. There's different people give different names to them. Um, they're spelled I G I G or sorry, I G I G I. <laughs> Gigi. They're, it's kind of a weird name, but in the that's how it's, they're spelled in the Kinea form, or at least that's the translation of the spelling in the Kinea form. So these Igigi were they were rebelling because they were doing all this hard labor here because this was not their home. They were visiting earth and they were building a, uh, basically a, a, an establishment, you know, you could call it a camp or a base and the Anunnaki, the rulers, they had them digging, um, trenches. They had them digging out canals. They had them mining gold. They, they, um, gold was something that they sought after. They were, um having them you know do all this manual labor probably cutting down trees clear cutting you know um areas they were filling in uh, marshes they're doing all this work heavy labor now the planet or the realm or the dimension they came from they probably had some kind of technology that did this work for them but when they were here they had to reduce themselves to manual labor and so they were really pissed off. So they all rebelled and they went to Enlil Yahweh's um, house to his, uh, you know, stronghold, whatever it was. And uh, they started demanding, you know, him to come to the gates. They were furious, you know, they were in rebellion. And so the, um, they they told in Lil, they woke him up, his, you know, people in his household, they woke him up, they told him, Hey, you know, our workers, the Yagigi, they're out there, they're they're demanding you, you know, they're they're pissed off, they're tired of all this labor, they're demanding, you know, justice, you know, um, somebody to replace them for you to do something about it. So when Lil goes to his brother and key, Ia, who is a sort of scientist of such. And alchemists, all kinds of things. And uh, so hence why he's named the serpent in the Garden of Eden, because he was very intelligent. In ancient times, uh, snakes, serpents were uh, symbolic of knowledge and wisdom. Well, he goes to Enki, his brother, and says, you know, I need you to do some about this. Our workers are rebelling and they won't dig the, you know, they're not digging the, the canals and, and doing everything they need to do. And so he, he, he asked his brother, is there something you can do about this? And Enki says, yes, I can build a Lulu, a primitive worker to replace the labors of the Igigi. And so what basically on earth at the time was, we, and we know this from anthropology, that there were other species of humanoids on the earth. You know, there were Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal. Through the ages, we found different uh, humanoid types. Well, the humanoid that was running wild at the time on the earth that they had witnessed, they decided to experiment and to genetically upgrade this hominid and to give it their essence and more intelligence. And they figured that they could fashion it into a worker race that they could use as slaves to do the labor to free the Agigi who were more or less like soldiers and stuff. They weren't meant to be, you know, it's almost like think of the Romans when they were conquering the world. When they would conquer, you know, at first you might have the Roman soldiers would 
set up earthworks and start building their bases and all that. But eventually they would get the local people to come in and do the labor for them. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of oversaw that. Well, that's what the Agigi were meant to be. They were not to, meant to be these hard labor workers forever. You know, they were like soldiers and stuff. So, um, so yeah, so Enki goes to his sister Ninma and also known as Isis in the Egyptian pantheon. Um, however, some believe she's Hathor, the birthing goddess, which she could be that also possibly Isis mm -hmm. or Hathor. And, um, and she's known as uh, um, Nin Herzag also, depending on, you know, Akkadian, Sumerian or whatever. But anyways, he goes to his sister and he asks her to help him. And so they start experimenting with these hominids and they are doing genetic tinkering on them. And this mm -hmm. is found, You people can reference this in the tablet Enki and Ninma. And in that tablet, they are drinking beer together, which is really odd. However, you'll find as you read it, it's like they're in a laboratory setting and they're experimenting with people and it's and they're kind of joking about it because they're like they're having all these problems like mutations and stuff and like say a guy they create a, an atomite but he doesn't have legs and she's like oh my god what are we gonna do with this guy he has no legs you know and and Anki's like oh well you know he can do this or that in the you know in the king's chamber you know <laughs> they're coming up with all these jobs that they can do even though these are like hardly even humans they're like experiments they're degenerates you know yeah and so that whole this whole tablet's just really odd it's like just going into detail about them tinkering with dna and and with this humanoid you know with this human mm -hmm. prototype and then you'll find later on in the atra hasis that uh that he, enki and ninmo were successful and that they created these uh this prototype adam an, an Adamite, uh, Adamu, they called it. And um, they then they realized, well, th there's something I want to add to this so people realize this, because this is very important in the Genesis story. So Ninma, like I mentioned earlier, she could be Isis or Hathor. Well, Hathor was the birthing goddess. Well, what Ninma had to do was she had to carry that zygote you know, that, uh, that, that, um, that infant in her own womb. And so she was called a, you know, a, um, a birthing mother or, a, a she was like a, um, like a midwife's goddess, you know, she was like a birthing goddess. Yeah. And there's a reason why we call moms mama, you know, when you're a baby say mama, well, that came from Ninma that goes all the way back to almost 6,000 years ago, where wow. that comes from. And it was because humankind, when we when the Homo sapien was first birthed, the first Adamite was birthed to Ninma. And so that there was a connection with that name. And it's almost like it's in our DNA as a species, a yeah. remembrance, you know, to this day. And yeah. um, but there was a problem with this, was that these Adamites they were starting to birth with just with not just Ninma, but with other birthing mothers like if you read about hathor there were other birthing goddesses that helped her well that's there were other women you know for all of you that think angels and watchers and all this are just males you are wrong okay mm -hmm. the anunnaki had it right these these uh these characters these anuna these elohim these angels these watchers they had they were females too okay they were not all males, according to what many people think, because of the biblical narrative. So there is a reason why ancient traditions always hold motherhood in a high esteem. Mm -hmm. Well, Ninma Isis was one of the most famous, you know, ancient goddesses. But this was why, because she birthed the first human into life. Now, these were like clones almost in a way. They were not able to procreate. So they had to do further tinkering with this prototype, and then they invented the the Eve. You would, uh, you know, Eve in the Bible, yeah. So that they could try to, you know, procreate this, right? Because they were having these birthing mothers keep producing these clones, but 
they needed a big workforce and you couldn't you couldn't put these anunnaki women you know through all of this hard labor over and over again they had to get these atomites to procreate so they were able to go in and keep tinkering with the dna and somewhere around 200,000 years ago um geneticists will even point to this time was when they were finally successful in the perfect genetic tinkering of the of the homo sapien that was when the brain of the humanoids on earth expanded that was when our dna that was when we became an official homo sapien so we go way back way further back than people think we do many yeah. many hundreds of thousands you know years of in the past and yeah, these anuna they were here way back this was not six thousand years ago like according to the bible i'm sorry i'll let you jump in here i i have a Just, bad uh, way of going on <laughs> no it's all good it's all good i i'm enjoying it but um yeah and then and then once we started procreating we got a little bit too prolific and then that caused them them some other problems and uh but it's also interesting that if you go into our genetics we actually have one or two chromosomes less than the great apes because somebody went in and did some splicing so there's physical evidence of what you're saying and yep. tinkered with us removed the redundancies and uh and here we are here here we are today if you ask me as a species we could be doing a little bit better than what we're doing today but that's kind of a different a different topic i want to just take a moment if it's okay with you bob to do a short promotion video and then we'll come back and then maybe you can segue this into what you know about the quantum field because that's super fascinating as well not trying to cut you off please feel yep. free to you know continue with whatever you want so i will just uh quickly get this done and then we will uh come right back hi guys Break time for a short message. YouTube will not monetize me, so if you enjoy my content and want to support my efforts, help me to cover my expenses by visiting my shop to buy yourself a beautiful organ generator. Zendome's Organite are my unique brand, and they are ethically sourced, handmade, and double-charged for maximum effect. They are only available through my website, www karenholtonhealthcoach.com. Many people are finding comfort with Zendome's organ generators, commonly called Organite. They are a simple compound which balance ambient energy by converting negative energy and EMF into positive healing energy with many easily confirmed health benefits. They are a simple compound with alchemic and energetic properties. These devices function as self-driven, continuously operating, highly efficient, negative to positive energy transmutation factories. They help diminish the harmful effects of electromagnetic frequency radiation by attracting and converting negative energies, retuning them into new and more healthful sound and light wave patterns. And they help to purify the atmosphere and accelerate plant growth. They also help stimulate positive mood and are a natural remedy for poor sleep patterns. When Organite is within range of any corded or wireless electronic device, it will efficiently and continuously transform that energy into Orgone as it is being transmitted. This essentially creates Orgone energy transmitters out of any and all emitters of harmful negative energy. You can use these devices for focusing the mind, healing, meditation, and for spiritual growth. Zendome's Organite are my unique brand of organ generators, and they are only available through my website. Don't be fooled by imitations. Check out my website to see my latest selection at www karenholtonhealthcoach.com that's k-a-r-e-n-h-o-l-t-o-n healthcoach.com check them out today now let's get back to the show 
So, um, so we left off, we were talking about uh, the origins of humanity and the nature of what some of us think is God and what's not God. And it's all very, very interesting stuff. I'm wondering um, if you want to dovetail that on into talking a bit about um, the quantum field, or did you have more you want to say about that before we transition over, Bob? Actually, I can uh, I can um, shift I, or um, I can transition uh, finishing off with this right into that perfectly. Wonderful, because Wonderful. it all ties together. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So if I don't know later on if you add anything in after. Um. If you do. Um. If people haven't heard about it, um. You can look it up online, but there's cylinder seals um, of what's called the tree of life. Now, this is a very, very important ancient depiction. And you'll find in a lot of ancient like temples and stuff that were left over from the Assyrians and the Babylonians and, and Sumerians, they always have these reliefs or cylinder seals of the tree of life. Now, this is absolutely important. This actually ties into the quantum field. So, in that same story, Atrahasis, now there was, they were talking about what they had, one of the things that they had to do to put life, to give life to this Adam, was they had to sacrifice one of the Anunnaki. This is in the Atrahasis. They, they said they had to sacrifice one of their own, and that gave life to the Adam. So now I've, I've often wondered, does that mean that they transferred the spirit? of that of that Anunnaki into the atom the into the um you know the into that atom avatar if that is that what they did you know um so it is interesting that that is found in that story and so i started looking at the tree of life now if you ever look at the tree of life uh, oftentimes you'll find uh this odd looking tree um, I, I'm, I have a picture of it here, but I'm doing this off my phone, so I can't do like a, a share, like a screen share, but people should look this up. But it's this odd looking tree. It doesn't really look like a tree. If you look at it, the branches on it are in the double helix design. And what you'll find on the ends of the, of the branches are flowers. And then at, then at the, typically at the top of this tree sometimes you'll find like a burst or you'll see um who's called this character in the zoroastrian religion called ahura mazda he's in this like flying little eagle device flying over the tree of life well then on each side of the tree you've got sometimes you've got humans sometimes angels and sometimes what are called the apkalu these characters that look like bird men and they're yeah. putting a pine cone into these flowers. And sometimes they're putting a metal rod in other depictions. Now this is very important because this is a representation of how they incept spirit into the human avatar. So the tree of life, DNA, okay? It's in the double helix design. The flowers represent the the woman's, you know, reproductive part, you know? Um, and, you know, uh, is oftentimes depicted as a flower without trying to be, you know, go too hard into this. <laughs> but, um, sorry. Um, so, there there's depictions of them putting these devices in there. Well, you got to think that they were doing um in vitro type fertil fertilization and such it was this was a this was a showing you that they were doing genetic upgrades to the dna of the human it's a representation of that and the pine the, the pine cone that they show that they're inserting this is the where it ties in with the quantum field and with spirit so that that the pine cone is revered in all ancient depictions in all ancient religions and that is because our pineal gland is in the shape of a pine cone. And the pineal gland, I like to call it the seat of the soul, because 
it is the connection point between spirit and the brain or the mind. It is the yeah. connection between the, um, you know, the non-physical with this, at least the illusion of the physical realm. And that, that, and we interface with this realm through the brain, which brings in our electrical, you know, gets, gives us the electrical signals from our senses, which paints the picture, the picture of this realm that you can call the matrix, the quantum field, you know, the third dimension or physical reality. And um, this pine cone is so very important because what they're showing in that depiction is that they they have to make that connection with the pine cone, with the, the spirit to the body, okay? Now, one thing I cannot answer to this day, and I've tried to figure this out, I can make inferences off of other ancient sources and tie it together. I don't know if they were trying to say that that they could force spirits to come into these avatars or if there was a way they enticed spirits to incept into these avatars. I'm not sure how that, that worked completely. Um, sometimes I also question if it was us, if we were the Elohim and we came down in a different form and created these bodies and then the replica, you know, then we were describing later on how we did that. It's hard to say. There's many different um, theories you can go into this. Possibly they were the Atlanteans, who you know that's who the Anunnaki were. But um, what they're trying to say though is that they had to incept spirits into these bodies. There's no life unless there's the conscious energy, which is typically what I call spirit. You know. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know if you want to jump in on that or not. No, it's really, yeah, it's very, very interesting. And don't worry, um, you know, um, I'm not going to be offended by you referring to Lady Bits as being flowers because it's a fact <laughs> of life. If it wasn't yeah. for that, we would not have any life. So, you know, it's yep, just how it yep, is. Yep. But um, I'm wondering <laughs> I'm wondering if the pine cone, yeah, I totally agree. I think it represents the pineal gland. And that seems to be the interface between spirit mm -hmm the three-dimensional reality we live in and spirit. And, um, you know, I know for myself and my own personal experiences, I've had some really interesting um, trans-dimensional experiences. And I believe it's my pineal gland that allows me to, to do that. So it's kind of like an interface. Mm -hmm. So people think that the pineal gland is just your imagination. Well, it is, but I think it's also like a portal and mm -hmm. um and through it you know we access spirit our higher selves you know uh, most of these different um sacred teachings you know when you boil them down we're kind of all talking about the same thing which is using a little bit mm -hmm. different language or imagery but um you know i would agree and you know uh, from listening to you yeah it makes sense maybe they used the pine cone represented a technology. So they took the spirit of the guy they sacrificed and put them, you know, and now, now, now they're, now we become, or we became living beings connected to source and with our spirit. Now, wasn't there a little bit later on where the Anunnaki realized they'd kind of made a mistake. They gave us too much power and then they had to what either i don't know if the flood was to eliminate a large portion of our numbers but also they then realized they needed to shorten our lifespan and dummy us down a bit do you have any thoughts about that bob yeah well yeah they absolutely did the the original atomites and you'll find this in the old testament where they have the longer lifespans they had humans had a lot longer lifespans and there, now there was a danger to the Anunnaki in this, because as you know, the longer you live, the more knowledge and wisdom you gain. Maybe not everybody, but typically most people, yeah. if you continue pursuing knowledge and yeah. expansion of mind and spirit and body, you, you know, you, you get more wisdom. So imagine if you live for a thousand years, imagine how intelligent you can become. So the Anunnaki quickly realized the danger in this because all of a sudden humans could at some point possibly surpass them 
even in understanding and knowledge. And because human beings are, we're not really human beings. We are conscious energy having a human experience. And so we are, we are fractals of source. So what they did was they took fractals of source, you know, these individual consciousnesses of source and were able to entice, like I said, or, you know, maybe, maybe we were just bored. It's what I've heard an interesting thing that people say that have near death experiences is that people on the other side, they've asked them before, well, why, why do we keep coming and incarnating on earth? And they say, it's simple. We get bored, <laughs> you know, because in the realm we come from, you can manifest everything you need or want or desire. Oh, so, yeah, you know, but we need, but we need the chat. We need the challenges to keep life interesting. People complain mm -hmm. when we have challenges, but it's the challenges that make life sweet. Exactly. Exactly. So, so, Hey man, look at it this way. Maybe they're just like, Hey guys, Hey, look at this, man. We just, and in, in, we created these awesome bodies. We need workers, but it'll allow you to come and experience a different realm than you've ever experienced. And, uh, there must've been something that drew people to, to come and sept into those bodies. Because from what I've, what I've, you know, I've listened to hundreds of NDEs and OBEs and they always say that we have a choice to come here or not. But, yeah. and, and, but like you mentioned, one of the reasons we come here is to learn, is to experience duality, love, hate, light, darkness, negative, positive, all the polarities of this realm. Because the realm we come from, it is truly, I know it sounds cliche to say, but people say it is all love and light in that realm. Yeah. You're, you're with source, you're close with source. I mean, we are always connected with source. But part of the rules of the game when we come to Earth, to this realm, is that we are, it's only a fraction of our spirit that comes here, of our consciousness. And it is coming here. It, want, it doesn't want to know everything. It, 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 ruins, it ruins the experience or the game if you know everything. So, so part of the rules of the game is you, get, you come here and you're cut off from the knowledge of your higher self. Mm -hmm. Most people are. Now, some people through meditation through maybe DMT or through near death experiences, they break back through that veil or yeah. maybe they just have spiritual abilities more aw awakened in them, you know, like psychics and such. Then, you know, some people are born that come in this, you know, come here and they keep those abilities. However, we all have that ability. That is all part of conscious energy. It's because, you know, our abilities uh, transcend this realm. However, mm -hmm. as when we're in this realm, it's just like in the movie The Matrix, right? You're when you're in the matrix, you you essentially are following the rules of the game unless you figure out that it is a game and you realize that it's not the truth. Once you realize that, now you can start to have bleed through on what you're able yes. to do in this realm because now you're starting to tap into extra dimensional um, abilities that you have, which is natural with your full, you know, spiritual conscious self. Yeah. And so yeah. people that can tap into that, they're starting to kind of bleed through the rules of the game, so to speak, you know, and, uh, maybe this is on purpose because let's be real folks. This realm of duality is very hard. Mm -hmm. and, and for anybody here that would say that's crazy, that the Anunnaki created these Adamites to be slaves, workers. Look at what we are born into now. Yes. The day you're born, you're, you get, you're given a social security number. And this is essentially the same for every nation on earth because yep. all the nations, they play like they follow the law of the land, but they all follow the law of, uh, the, law of the sea, which is yes. not beholden to natural law. They cheat is what they do. But what they do is they give you a social security number. Think of it like tagging your cattle, right? Yes. And, um, and they, and you're that day you're born, you're already in debt to the day you die to your nation. You're born under that, that social security number is traded on the stock market as a collateral on the U S debt. If you're an American 
And there's something mm -hmm. else they do. Now, this is magic and trickery that they do to you. When you're born, they also do something to you. When you're a baby, they get your footprint and they put it on your birth certificate, right? Well, there's a reason why they do that. They're putting your soul on a contract. They, they're trying to essentially say that like, they're, they're trying to make a play on, on word magic there. You know, the soul of your feet, think of it, your soul. And they're imprinting it on that paper, on that contract of your birth. Because now that you're in this realm, you're under their rules. And you're once again, a worker. No different than, than what we were as the Lulus. We are still there. We are still working for their system. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, even 100 to, well, let's say 200 years ago and, be, and before that, um, there was the, a, few, a couple people that had all the power and everybody else worked the land and gave the best they had to the rulers. Um, their life spans were short because they worked so hard. They didn't get proper nutrition. And I got to say, you know, um, but nowadays, oh, my God, it's like every week there's two, three, four, five, six disasters and, and strange shenanigans with governments. And I won't even get into just the last two weeks. It's been crazy what, what the information that's been coming out. And, you know, but I got to tell you, Bob, uh, for me, I was just one of those people that was just trying to cope and trying to make ends meet and trying to, you know, um, try to deal with the social reality. And, you know, there's a lot going on there too. But none of this occurred to me, but it took sort of tragedy and trauma to really open my eyes and just to start seeing what was going on. And so what I've done is created kind of a little reality within the greater reality where I'm in touch with, I don't have perfect connection with, but I'm in touch with my higher self. I'm well aware that there's so much more to me than what society would want me to, to know or to believe. I've created a, a, a quite literally engineered a lifestyle that's sustainable. I learn how to eat properly for me. I learn how to, you know, get enough rest, to get, to get enough exercise, take care of my body. Um, you know, have loving relationships, you know, with my pets and my family and, you know, a handful of friends that are really good people. And, and so no matter what the gong show or clown world is doing, you know, I've got respite within my own engineered reality that I created. And it didn't happen overnight. It took me years and years to finally get this together. But, you know, you can, I think, have a good life within mm -hmm. the slave system mm -hmm. but you're absolutely right on with the slave system and it's it's just a tragedy and you see people and they're so burnt out and they're so unhappy and nobody is telling them the truth and that's why you do uh you know you do podcasts like what you do i do what i do because we're trying to show people that once you face it and wake up to it you can step out and there's so much that we can enjoy while we're here. And the good news is no matter how bad it gets, it doesn't last forever. Now, Bob, we're quickly running out of time, but I want to turn it back over to you to sort of tie up loose ends, put it all together and share your message with humanity that you have for encouragement. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, no matter, like you mentioned, I mean, things get dark. Uh, I mean, there are dark things. I mean, that that's part of why we come here. It's to experience that, right? I mean, if you never experience that as a spirit, you're not going to ascend higher because there are different levels and dimensions to consciousness, you know, and uh, it's not like every, that there's only one realm outside. It's not just like a one heaven and just earth and heaven. There are multiple dimensions and realms and levels you know so um but what i always try to teach people is look we have power over this realm i want people to understand this now this is one thing the anunnaki feared they shortened our lifespans to to uh, limited us to 120 years they shortened our telomeres that that was 
what Karen had mentioned earlier about the chromosomes. They fused two of them together. That shortened our lifespans to 120 years. They also put what's called the God gene in us, which makes us have a penchant for wanting to worship somebody higher than us, whether that means a God character or if that means a uh, government. Some people worship government. Some people worship religion, you know, and God. But I want people to understand we are fractals of source. We are individual consciousness and we have dominion over this realm. Even if you look at the Genesis version in the Bible, it said Adam and Eve were given dominion over all the animals in the earth, right? There's secret to that. It, it goes back to the hermetic teachings. We are directly interfaced in with the quantum field. It has to obey us. We've seen this in this double slit experiment. Quantum yes. physics is starting to connect science with spirituality. Now, one thing I've learned is that you can alter your life. You can alter your experience here. You can alter how this reality bends to your will, in fact. Now, the mystery school teachings have kept this away from us for a long time. And religion tells you not to delve into this stuff because they say it's witchcraft, but it is not. It is your God-given right to have dominion over this realm. And that's why they fear us. No matter how much, shorten they, much they shorten our lives or whatever, you can command the, the quantum field to do things for you. You can command it to open up doors for you. Now, I'm not saying to be disrespectful like I am God and I demand. No, it's in respect. We have powers over the elementals of this realm. We have powers over the quantum field. You can go to the quantum field and just say, look, I need this done and this done. I need this door open and this door open. And you have to understand that it takes a little bit of time for the quantum field to move all those energy particles around. It has to rearrange. So things don't manifest instantly. And there's a good thing that things don't manifest in instantly because what if yeah. you have a bad thought and it happens instantly? You can cause chaos, right? So there's a wait time for manifestation to happen. You just have to hold that belief in that in that thought and keep adding to it and just be respectful and demand that things be done. And I'm telling you, you don't have to pray to a God or any of this because you are one with source. You are doing what you've already been given dominion or you're you are already. Remember, Yeshua was trying to teach us. It's not what goes in a man's mouth that's evil. It's what comes out. Don't you yeah. know the kingdom of heaven is within? You know that he was trying to teach these these secrets. He was trying to teach us that we have power over this realm. And they were trying to twist that and put people back under like control mechanisms. And fear-based mind control is what a lot of religion is. But yeah. you can you can if you want to truly change your life, think about what you what you really want. Start believing it will happen. Start interfacing it with the quantum field and with source. If that if that makes you feel better, but see, source is already within you. You know, you are the son of God, the daughter of God, the son or daughter of man. You're both, just like Yeshua was. He, remember what he said: you can heal the sick, you can cast out demons, you can even move mountains, you can do greater than I. He was trying to teach you these things. Because, see, he understood you just do it. You know, you just, he understood how to have that control over the quantum field. And he was trying to teach us over this realm, over the, the, the energetic side of this realm. And so I want people not to fear all this. You need to grow in your power. You need to claim dominion over this realm again because you have a right. You have a birthright to it. When you were birthed into this realm, you come with the full power of source within you and behind you and in front of you. And, and you have dominion over that quantum field and believe. Now, sometimes you got to do different things. And now there is one rule I need people to understand because it's not like the secret where it's just all thinking about stuff. The, there is an energy exchange that has to happen. So you have to put action into things. You can't mm -hmm. just ask and beg. You have to act. You know, if you want to make more money, then go start a side hustle. Go start thinking of a product you could make or you and then ask the quantum field 
tell it what you need it to do for you. And it'll be, you'll be amazed how doors will open for you because the, the universe is abundance. There is no want for anything. And that's true in this realm too. We just have been lied to and we've been yep. limited. Yep, absolutely. Uh, it's true for me. If it's true for me and it's true for you, Bob, it's true for all of us because it's our birthright. I agree with you 100%. So before we close the show, a couple things. One is I want you to tell people what you got going on, what you got going on on your channel, what you're up to, and also where people can reach you. Now, a lot of people will be listening to this on audio, and so it's good for you to say um, the actual uh, where people can find you, um, you know, for those that are listening on audio, but also uh, it's good for people to hear it again. I want to give a shout out to Tennessee, Kentucky Bigfoot. Thank you for joining us. Selena Ingalls also joined us earlier. And um, but before we go, I also want to say, Bob, I want to have you back because we barely scratched yeah. the surface. Yeah, so I know. I, I tried to do a real quick Reader's Digest version. And thinking yeah. back, I realized I missed some steps I would have liked to put in there. To, but I kind of well, hope I gave everybody a, like a large picture, you know, tie in. It was great. It was, a, it was, it was great. It was really great. And, and you know, uh, what I'll do is I'll contact you by email. We'll tie up another, tee up another, another date and hopefully you can come back and, and share, share more information. That would be lovely. But for now, tell people um, what you're up to and where they can find you. You know, I'm just continuing to build my brand exit the matrix um, the two easiest places to find me is going to be on Facebook. That's my largest following. Um, I'm around a hundred and uh, was it now 42 K I think on there. Um, so th that's where I do most of my work is from Facebook um, because like, you know, <laughs> that's the, that's where everybody is, right? P Facebook mm -hmm. and YouTube, those are big platforms. And so uh, just, uh, you can just simply look me up exit the matrix Um uh, the with a capital T exit the matrix. Um, I'm the first page that'll come up on there. Um, if you Google, uh, Google me, it'll come up, I think on the second page on Google, but it'll be a link to that Facebook. And then I have, I do have a YouTube channel. It's kind of a fledging channel. I've only started about a year and a half ago, but I think we're up to like 2,100 subscribers. So we're growing. And then I'm also on X and Instagram, but those are I'm not real involved with those. So I'd say YouTube and Facebook are the best places to reach me. And would anybody look, can message me there too. Would they look for you by, under Bob Engel or would they look for you under Exit the Matrix? Exit the Matrix. Yeah, that's what I thought. And of course, all, all the links will be in the description be below. So Bob, thank you so much for joining me on the Quantum Guide Show. It's been a real pleasure. Loved your information. Can't wait to talk more uh, more about it. And I want to thank the uh, listeners and the viewers and the people that popped into the live chat today. It's been great. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And we'll see you next week on the Quantum Guide Show. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining me for the Quantum Guide Show become the change that you wish to see in the world. Subscribe to my YouTube and other channels at Karen Holton TV. Click the like button, leave me a comment, and share this podcast with your friends. Check out my website at www.KarenHoltonHealthCoach.com to see my free resources and amazing products and services. All the links will be in the description below. As part of the Forbidden Knowledge Network, you will find the Quantum Guide Show with Karen Holton and also the Aliens and Angels podcast on all audio platforms. Until next time, keep up the good work.